Okay, folks, it's your buddy Mike Messier. Uh, Hide Out Camp, I believe, is the movie I just saw. I believe it's called Camp Hideout or Hideout Camp or Hideaway Camp. This movie has not been advertised a whole lot. Of course, as you know, there's this actor strike and the writer's strike going on. Drew Barrymore, uh, exception. Exception noted, Drew. We know you're not in on the strike, okay? Because your show is an essential service for everybody. But in any regard, I went to see this movie today. For some reason, this movie was calling my name. I know that there's bigger offerings or, you know, more, more hyped up offerings, A Haunting in Venice and so forth. That Beatle movie, that superhero movie, I still have not seen. There's a couple of horror movies out that I have seen. Here we go. So, uh, it lives inside. I've seen all these things. I wanted to see this movie. I don't know why. Um, it started at 6.30. The timing was right. The movie wasn't too long in length. I got there uh, just in time, saw a preview or two, and then the movie started. Uh, here's to me. So let's discuss this thing. Um, first off, for those of you that don't know me, I'm uh, Mike Messier. One Mike Messier is this channel for all your film reviews, your life rants. I do tend to swear. I do tend to speak my mind. If you say, well, gee whiz, Mike, what gives you this uh, opinion? What made you earn this opinion? Well, you can go to One Man and a Camera Films and see my movies that I make, uh, films that I've acted in. You can go to one pro wrestling and sports fan to see my pro wrestling stuff, my re uh, my sports stuff, my interview with Randy Couture, interview with Bob Backlund, Ox Baker, one of the boys, but enough about me. Uh, but if you like my art, you can go to one artist, Mike Messier, and see all my wonderful art, of which I created this uh, somewhat of a masterpiece today in Gainesville, Florida. Look at that. That can be yours. Uh, you can go to the Foreign Object eBay store and purchase it. Or one of my books, if you go to the links, uh, a lot of you people have not bought my books yet, but you should because they're fucking good. So let's discuss this movie. Uh, what did I think? Well, first of all, I kind of like the movie despite itself. You might be saying, well, gee whiz, Mike, what does that mean? There are some creative flaws in this film that I will get into. We'll get into the weeds. I do think that the film has a good heart, a good message. Uh, it's not overbearing with its message. I think it's a good movie that you could take kids to, but you don't necessarily need to be a kid. You could be a kid at heart, okay, and see this one. I saw it, uh, and I liked it, okay? I did like the movie. I never, you know, it made me reflect upon my own childhood, my own, you know, t tweens, teens, and so forth. I did not have a whole lot of camp in my life, not a whole lot of nature, I, I kind of like nature to a point, you know, like to an extent. I like the beach, you know, but I like indoor plumbing. I like uh, to be able to get into air conditioning if so inclined. So I haven't been like a camp guy or a let's go out in a tent, you know, let's go uh, sleep with the barracudas or whatever the fuck's out there. Um, but I do appreciate a good camp story. And this is actually the second camp movie of the year. The first one that I can recall was Theater Camp. This one's of a much different tone. Um, this is my thing with this movie. It did feel, and no, see, I know that this is interesting because like the movie started, before I went to see this movie, I saw the PG rating, I believe it's PG, and I'm like, I bet this is like somewhat of a Christian movie again, which is fine, but they kept it very undercover. It wasn't until like 20 minutes in that there was any hint of the movie being any type of Christian movie, and that's when one of the camp counselors you know, goes to sit on a log and he pulls out a book from his uh, backpack and I knew it was going to be a Bible. And uh, then he's kind of looking out into the, to the fucking dew into the morning and the kid comes over and I'm like, okay, here we go. And there, this is what I think. There's so many thoughts I have. First of all, um, this movie has like a lot of elements. It's, it, you can see the filmmaker, the writer, and the, the writer, one of the writers, the director, the same last name, I don't know if they're brother and sister, husband and wife, cousins, whatever, um, but basically, it's like the influences are so on the surface, it's like, okay, Meatballs, you know, like the, the summer camp movies, Meatballs, but way toned down to a, a PG rating, then you have a, a, a heavy influence of the Home Alone movies, especially the first one, 
of the bun bumbling crooks, you know, the Joe Pesci and Daniel Stern that made them famous. We have a couple of bumbling crooks. Then we have the Save by the Bell influence, okay, which is basically, you know, the teenagers or the, the young people and then the, the Zach Morris, like, you know, what they call the Morris, looking to the camera, making a smirk, making a funny face or one or two lines, the Morris uh, from Saved by the Bell stuff, you know, which, you know, kind of Ferris Bueller kind of did some of that too and so forth. Then, or I guess Ferris Bueller did it first, the film, because I believe Ferris Bueller film came out in 86, and I want to say uh, Saved by the Bell was, what, 89 or 90? It was originally entitled something else. Uh, but anyway, and what other influences? Well, you do have, uh, basically the biggest star in this movie is Christopher Lloyd, and I saw him in this, you know, Doc from Back to the Future, Jim from Taxi, I believe he was also in one flew over the cuckoo's nest, and I believe he was in The Dream Team, which is kind of a movie I haven't watched in so long. Michael Keaton, I believe Christopher Lloyd, and a couple of others. I should watch that movie again. Kind of an underrated classic. Uh, makes me think of another Michael Keaton underrated classic, Multiplicity, which people don't talk about enough. Uh, anyway, so Christopher Lloyd was really the only actor that I recognized in this movie. Um, they probably spent a good portion of the budget of this film on him at least as far as the casting budget. Uh, I believe the movie, there was a Tennessee license plate. I don't know if the movie was filmed in Tennessee. I could have been in this fucking movie. No offense, I guess with my swearing, the Christian producers would not appreciate that, but I know how to tone it down. So let's talk. Um, basically, the oh, okay. The movie just has one too many elements in it. I mean, first off, we start off with a kind of a chase scene. This kid, Noah, the, the actor was fine. I just, no offense to any Noahs out there. I don't think Noah is a leading man type of name. Uh, you know, Trevor would have been good. Like, if you want, like, a rebellious name, you know, something. But, I mean, even Dylan, as cliche as that is. But just Noah... I mean, I just I guess I'm basing... I mean, I, who are the Noahs that we know in this world? The Ark, gentlemen. Uh, the, the Oasis guy. And I know a guy from high school named Noah who was a fine gentleman, but he was mostly known for his uh, good scores in science class. So, I mean, Noah is not like a real rebellious go get him name. It must have been someone in the lives of the writer or someone who's, oh, yeah, that Noah guy, he was a badass. Well, I mean, the name doesn't work, okay, for your leading man. No offense to any Noahs, okay? I don't want to get any hashtag, uh, respect Noah hashtag, all right? But then, um, so the kid's on the lam. The kid's being chased by the security officer. And then he sees a school bus, and he runs over to the school bus to basically hide because he's getting chased. And he sees this pretty blonde uh, young woman, and you're like, oh, is this his love interest? But no, the, the pretty blonde young woman, because the kid's probably 15 or 16 or 14, the pretty young blonde is actually his counselor. And I, I don't know if I'm just getting so goddamn old that all these young people look alike, but the counselor looks like she's 18 or 19. Uh, I guess in reality, she's 25 or 30, but she looks very young to me anyway. Uh, compliments to the actress. Um, because it just, it seemed like they were more like brother and sister. Like the the counselor, at first glance, looked like she was about two years older than the kid. So I don't know. Maybe she's just a good-looking woman who looks young. But, I mean, to me, she didn't look old enough to be a counselor or wish I had a counselor like that. But uh, the kid, she's like, oh, I guess you decided to come to camp, you know, blah, blah, blah. And the kid gets on the fucking bus. And, of course, the kid doesn't have his underwear or his socks because he's running from the security guard. Then the kid's getting on the bus. He's trying to find a, a place to sit down. And within moments, you kind of have this whole movie la mapped out. You see, like, oh, there's the, the pretty girl, the love interest. I believe her the character's name was Mandy or Melissa or something like that. Uh, she's making Google faces at him, but she's got some girl sitting next to him. Do you see, like, the surfer dude, the antagonist, like, the biff of the movie? Uh, Blonde-haired, blue-eyed uh, antagonist, you know, Aryan kid. Uh, you know, Trey, I think it was his name. He, he can't sit next to Trey because he's the bad guy of the movie. Um, then you see the fat kid with zits. And of course you sit next to the fat kid with zits because the fat kid with zits, or, you know, not to offend the actor, but the pleasantly chubby fucking kid, the fat kid with zits, that's who you sit next to, right? So you sit next to the fat kid with zits. 
who's asking a million questions, the know-it-all of the whole goddamn camp. Now, the whole time the kid, Noah's sitting next to this kid, um, you're thinking, oh, he's stuck next to this kid because there's nowhere else to sit. Well, right behind them, there's a little blonde girl with no one sitting next to her. Then we cut to a couple of other scenes. We come back to the bus, and magically, Noah's with the fat kid with zits, and behind them is two girls, the blonde girl and another girl. So we had a little continuity error there, folks. We had a lot of little continuity. Uh, the young lady who was sitting on the bus seat wasn't there for a few shots, which would have made sense if she was, because then Noah couldn't sit in that seat with the little blonde girl. But now suddenly she's there because the actress came back from the restroom or from holding, uh, from eating a Snickers bar or looking at her cell phone or whatever the fuck happened. But you get my point continuity issues i'm trying to help these uh, these low budget filmmakers make better movies because i'm just a nice generous individual so let's move on um then we have the the, the storyline basically is like i said see the movie it's fine but the thing with uh, the kid noah is running because he was kind of brought into this crime ring with these two bumbling fucks tall one little one that they were trying to steal some type of gizmo, basically like it's a handheld Sega Genesis or whatever the fuck game it was, some type of handheld 16-bit fucking device uh, that they're trying to steal, and supposedly it has magic powers, we'll get into that in a minute, and that basically the two bumblers, you know, left the kid high and dry when the cops were called. I did like their um, initial crime device, they, they had like a fake plant, like literally a, a big plant a potted plant and they snuck the kid Noah into the bottom and they snuck him into a building but then the security guards we have this little flashback where we see where and I like that device uh, of getting us up to speed the exposition if you would uh, is told in a nice flashback but then once we start you know once we get to camp it's like you know we've been we've seen movies like this the camp movie it's kind of a good way to make a movie because um, you know, you can get a, like, if you rent out a real campground somewhere, you know, with different buildings or whatever the fuck, you can kind of make a nice movie that's a singular location, you know, one location movie for the most part, you can film a whole movie there, you have all your, you know, video montage, the kids on the swing, people falling into the water, uh, Noah and Mandy making goo goo eyes at each other. Our buddy Noah, who's an angry young man, you know, he doesn't have parents for whatever reason. I guess they're deceased, uh, but his, his, his hard heart is starting to mellow. He's starting to make friends uh, with the chubby zit face kid and the, I hate to say it, token black kid. I mean, I'm just saying these things because this is how the movie presents itself to me. Maybe I'm the bad guy you know, for, for seeing things this way in this warped perspective, but this is how I was raised, okay? So he's got these friends. Uh, he's got a love interest with Mandy or Melissa, whatever her name is. She's making goo-goo eyes. He's making goo-goo eyes. He's got a rival, this Trey kid. I did feel like the antagonist of Trey was a little, um, in, and not to say inept, but just... They didn't give an, enough danger or enough heat on that kid. Uh, it, it wasn't the actor's fault. Just the script was a little too soft. Like, I think Trey should have gotten, like, one good punch in on Noah or tripped him and made him fall in the grass or something just to establish him as a bad guy because Trey never really gets, like, the upper hand on Noah. Uh, and you know, I mean, you just fucking know, so to speak, that Trey is going to come around. He's going to help Noah out. By the end of the movie, they're going to be buds, bro. And he fucking does. But until we got to that point, I would have liked to have seen uh, Trey be a little bit more of a bad guy because that's what he's supposed to be, okay? So moving forth in this film, uh, you know, what else is going on? Oh, okay, here's the thing. The, the Christian stuff, there's this term that people use. I'm going to give uh, you know, credit here to play submissions helper. They had like an article or a fucking podcast about this phenomena when there's like people that like like when theater houses are looking for holiday plays like say they're looking for a christmas play and then playwrights think they're clever and just take one of their old beat up you know play scripts that have not been produced and they basically put the characters in a, like a ski lodge or a, or a christmas you know pageant or put like christmas sweaters on the characters uh play houses theater you know, submission readers can tell, oh, this was just a regular play, 
and they put Christmas sweaters on people or they put, you know, uh, winter hats on everybody just to make it seem like a Christmas play. I kind of suspect, no offense, that this script existed in some form uh, before the Christianity thing was kind of interwoven because it's not interwoven a whole lot. We don't really see any type of Bible thing until 20 minutes into the thing. We see a church at the very end of the movie, uh, but it's all very surface level. There's not a whole lot of stuff in this movie that's screaming, you know, lessons of the Lord or Jesus would have done or what this or what that. And there's really no, you know, not, no one even says, hey, Noah, you're, you're named after this guy, uh, you know, with this ark and all that cool stuff. Like, basically, it's just... I don't want to say an afterthought, but it's a kind of a throw on thing. Like, okay, put the Christmas sweater on, put the, put the Santa hat on and make this movie a Christian movie. Uh, really wasn't a Christian movie other than the fact that they did that. And uh, I'm not saying that the movie's bad. I'm just saying I caught your tricks, folks. I caught you. So uh, that was that. I mean, look, you know, wh whatever. I mean, I'm just saying like, I kind of been around the block with these things. I can tell these little shortcuts. Uh, also, like I said, you can see all the influences. You can see, look at that wonderful art once again. You can see the meatballs, you know, the summer camp, the uh, whatever, the whatever. Uh, you can see all these influences. Everything is wonderful. Um, you know, female empowerment. There's a couple of little girls in this movie that are sharpshooters with paintballs. Here's the worst part of the movie. Um, basically of the last 30 minutes of the movie, a good chunk of that, 20 minutes of it at least, is this extended homage, if you would, to Home Alone, where the bumbling crooks come to the camp for the second time, uh, looking to get their video game device from Noah. The problem is, um, it just drags on, and I think whoever the filmmakers were, the writer, the director, whatever their connection, they remember this type of comedy, this type of slapstick, you know, bumbling idiot comedy from Home Alone more fondly than I think, at least I do, and probably a lot of audience members do, especially if they're trying to get kids of today. Because we've seen all the crap on YouTube, we've seen, you know, the human blunders, the, you know, fall off the fucking tricycle or fall off the, the fucking Stairmaster, or, you know what I mean? There's been so many bumbling things that like what they were doing in this it just felt so home alone and just just too much of it just too long and also logically because i'm a logical guy um you know noah and his friends set up like this whole series of of blunders for these two crooks to go through slipping on wood and so forth you know slipping on coconut oil on the fucking uh wooden pavilion and stuff it's like but then they have other obstacles later on. So it's like, why would you even have them slip on coconut oil on wood if you knew that they were going to get through that, meaning the crooks, and then get bumble fucked with something else? Why don't you just, you know, hit them in the head with a, a tree branch and, and, you know, aim for the temple and kill them? I mean, if you're really trying to, and, and for, for that matter, I mean, I know it's a movie. That's why, that's the answer. It's a movie. But I mean, why aren't the crooks coming in with guns and just shooting everybody. You know what I mean? And I understand I'm answering my own question. It's because it's a PG rated movie and you're not gonna have crooks come in and shoot a bunch of kids. Uh, that's reality. Uh, but in a movie, you know, the, the bumbling crooks are just gonna, we're gonna get you. We're wearing leather jackets and uh, you know what I mean? But in reality, they just come in and shoot some motherfuckers. So then it's just like, okay. That's what would have worked and did work in 1991 or 90, whatever, with, with Macaulay Culkin and Home Alone. 2023 with Noah, I don't think it works. Sorry. And there's this other element to that where the kids in the camp all kind of rally around Noah. Uh, and they all kind of like, you know, deceive the camp counselors in order to set up this booby trap for these, these bad guys. But the reality is, it's like the camp, the camp counselors, camp counselors, camp counselors, camp counselors have proven to be on the kid's side. So they're kind of like, why do you have to be, you know, secretive towards the camp counselors? The camp counselors have already proven to be looking out for Noah and all the kids. So it's kind of like this element of crap that you don't really need. 
Uh, there is a big food fight scene in this thing. You know, Trey throws a chunk of food at Noah. Noah retaliates with a whole hamburger at Trey's face. Food fight! And then, you know, it wasn't the best food fight. Some of the supposed ketchup looked like fucking uh, paint, to be honest with you. I wasn't totally buying um, the, 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 the thinking that this was supposed to be some type of legitimate ketchup, okay? I mean, no offense, but whoever did the... Uh, the props or the whatever you want to call it, the ketchup, it, it just did not look like authentic ketchup in several of these scenes, at least uh, to me, it looked like paint. Okay, so I was upset about that. Um, what else? Oh, Christopher Lloyd, like screaming at the top of his lungs to end the food fight. That was actually a lot of fun. If you like Christopher Lloyd, he's kind of unintelligible. Like you don't know what the hell he's saying. It's kind of like I saw this thing today. Um, the Peyton, the Peyton Manning brothers, the, the Peyton brothers, the Manning brothers did this thing about looking for a new co-host and they had all these different celebs, you know, with little, you know, fucking whatever the fuck's cameos. And they had Mike Tyson come in and they actually closed captioned Mike Tyson, uh, saying that you can't understand them. And I thought it was kind of funny, like, oh man, I can't understand Christopher Lloyd, but he was so angry and agitated. It was pretty good. So, I mean, you know, it is what it is. Overall, like I said, you can kind of see that the filmmakers have a good heart. They're looking out for people. They're trying to save the day and save the world and all that good stuff. The Jesus thing, the God thing. I mean, if you if you don't like Christian movies, uh, you can probably see this movie and you would barely notice it. You know what I mean? Because it's hardly there. Like I said, it just felt like a screenplay that had been around. And they put the Christmas sweater on a couple of scenes and there you go. Uh, like I said, I felt like the solution to this movie, to making it better, would be basically to eliminate the whole crime thing. Oh, and also, in the last scene in the movie, we see that this game device controller, like this, you know, handheld Genesis, whatever the fuck, it is magical. Like, we put our fucking, you know, $50 uh, program, computer editing program to use, and we have, like, a little magic coming from the game. It's like... Okay, I guess we need a sequel to explain this thing because nowhere in this movie did it was it understood why this game controller is magical. But luckily, we can um, say, "Hey, this movie is going to be so great. We're going to need to make a sequel, and then we'll explain this whole other element that we didn't explain in the first movie." Okay, see you next summer. I mean, I guess we're hooked in now because me and the other people in the theater, which is basically nobody else are going to come rushing back next summer to see the sequel of Noah and all his friends. I mean, I'm sure by the time they make the sequel, Noah and Mandy will be married with five kids. So they their kids can discover the secret of the nymph for the secret of the fucking controller or whatever the fuck. So just a little word to the wise. If you're making a one-off movie, like no, no offense, people, you know, but there's no guarantees you're going to get a sequel. Um... And to just kind of like leave this hanging Chad, okay, uh, George Bush, Al Gore, leave this hanging Chad of a story element, it's not helping matters. It's not helping your film. It's just frustrating reviewers like me. Uh, so what else? Um, the kids were all good. I mean, look, oh, the whole Zach Morris thing with Noah, another element that you really didn't need, it was just... You needed to either add more of that or less of it. And I think because it was used so sparingly, sparsely. What's the difference between sparsely and sparingly? I don't know. But the element was used so little that you didn't need it. Okay? I mean, I guess I have to go into these low-budget fucking film meetings and fix everyone's script. Because these things are so obvious to me. At least there was no spelling errors in this movie. I saw a movie a year and a half ago in the theater that was from Texas, low-budget movie. It had an apostrophe error right in the middle of the movie. This one, we did not have any... Uh, I don't think it even had any captionings at any point or anything, but that was probably for the best. It, I mean, I'm, I'm thinking that this was some type of, you know, $200,000 or less or $2 million or less movie. Um, like I said, most of that probably went to Christopher Lloyd or a good chunk of it. Um, but it didn't look low budget. The cinematography was nice. The views were nice. I mean, I think the editing was fine. Better editing in this movie than uh, the movie I saw the other night, the uh, My Big Fat Greek Wedding 3, which had a lot of continuity problems that I discussed in my review of that one. So this movie seemed, you know, technical. Audio was good. Visuals were good. Um, like I said, I just think it's a thing where 
I don't know if it's a first time writer, first time director. I don't know. Um, but it's just like, here's all the things we love about movies. Let's put them all into one movie. And you know what I mean? The Saved by the Bell, uh, Zach Morris, the, the bumbling, uh, bad guys, Home Alone, uh, the God stuff, you know, like everything was Christopher Lloyd. Like everything is coming into one movie. Uh, the summer camp stuff, uh, the life lessons, you know, it's just like, Hey, can we just roll back? Do we have to have all this stuff in one film? That's how I feel. I mean, you know, I, I just, I, I get it. You love movies. You made one. Congratulations. But you don't have to show all your hands in one fucking deck. What was that movie with uh, Fred Savage about the video game, like the Nintendo 8-bit? I've never even seen the movie, but I know it's like a movie that wasn't very good or wasn't very well received. But then like the whole video game thing, like I said, just shoehorned in there. I could have, I mean, this is what I would have done if I had been involved in this creative process, which I was not. I would have totally eliminated the whole fucking uh, bad guys thing. I would have just said, like, the, the, first of all, they did okay. Like, the Laurel and Hardy, tall and fat, or tall and skinny, you know, short and skinny with the leather jacket. The bad guys, they did all right. They weren't bad. It's just, it doesn't work for today's audience. I just, I just hate to say it, but I just did. Uh, it doesn't work for today's film community. Nobody cares. And it just felt like, like I said, 12 pounds of shit in a 10 pound bag, okay? So what's the solution? You just have a deal where Noah goes off to fucking camp and he's on, you know, like, like you can just have him like pick a fucking candy bar from the fucking 7-Eleven or something. And just say, and he gets busted. Like, hey, one more infringement, you're going to juvie. You know, you've stolen one candy bar too many, uh, or whatever, and or something like this. God, so so simple because I'm smart. Uh, beginning of the movie, our buddy Noah there gets into a fight, like a fist fight. There has to be security or police called, and basically Noah's on suspension or parole or whatever the juvies go on. You get into one more fight, you punch one more kid, and you're going to juvie. And so then when he goes to the summer camp, he gets sent to the summer camp and Trey's picking on him, he can't fight back. It's so simple. So like Trey can pick on him and, and our buddy there, Noah, he has to turn the other cheek because he's getting picked on. And that's, you can even bring in the Bible there because then Jake, the summer counselor, can say, what's wrong, Noah? I want to fight this kid, Trey, because he's picking on me. Well, why don't you, you know, hey, I don't want to tell you what to do, but if you really feel like you need to fight back, then fight back. Well, I can't. Why not? Because if I punch one more kid, I go to Juvenile Hall. Oh, and then they have to figure it out. So that's a better movie. You don't need uh, the bumbling, fumbling, uh, Home Alone, you know, contrived homage storyline because I just fixed the movie. Unfortunately, the movie's already been made and we can't do a damn thing about it now. Uh, but yeah, I mean, Jake, the counselor, can even use that uh, opening like, oh, you have to turn the other cheek. Well, Jesus said when you turn the other cheek, blah, 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 blah. So, I mean, there, I fixed it. I fixed the movie. Too bad it's too late. Also, I mean, look, if you're going to have a love story in this thing, you know, obviously they, they kind of get halfway with this thing. The Manny and Melissa girl or whatever, she's intrigued by Jake because he's different than the other boys. Well, she's having the bad boy syndrome. She likes the bad boy. So let's, 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 you know, explore that relationship. Young love, you know what I mean? Like opposites attract. Mandy's from a good home, we assume. Why is she attracted to this bad boy, this ruffian? And we can, you know, do a little West Side Story routine. They can break out into song and dance if you want. But they kind of just leave them there. Like they just float. Like, you know, first we have a little bit of a hints of teen romance and then we just go away from it. Okay. But that's why I'm saying there's too many elements in this film uh, for any element to be fully accomplished. Despite all these uh, characteristics and all these shortcomings, I still like the movie because I'm a nice guy because, look, I try to support the cinema. I try to support people making movies. Uh, casting me would be nice because I could fix all these fucking problems. But beyond all that, I thought the movie was good. I liked it. It's a feel-good movie. It's like take the kids to the movie or fucking most people will fucking rent this if they ever find it. And there you go. So uh, hats off, hat on hat off. I'm sure that some of these people will be big stars someday. Maybe they'll find this review and say, gee whiz, this guy had it all figured out. Uh, that's it, folks. So subscribe. Uh, one Mike Messier. 
is here for your film reviews. Uh, one man and a camera films for my movies. One artist, Mike Messier, for my art. And uh, one pro wrestling and sports fan for my pro wrestling takes. Buy my books, fight or play basketball. If you like kids so much, that's my teen sports novel. And so forth. Goodbye.